the way that I am telling you about this book is going to be very different than the way that I write this book insofar as we are communicating in two different media forms. And so this is why I think it's important to recognize what media form is being utilized and to recognize that there are a diversity of media forms in the ancient world because that is going to change the way the change the way that the message is communicated at the end of the day. So we have a sociality to media and we do have a sense in which humans haven't changed in the last 2000 years, but what we put our thought into, how we communicate our thought does affect how that thought is received by other humans. Welcome to It Means What It Means, the podcast in which a guy with some college and a day job asks experts questions about biblical studies. Today's guest is Nicholas Elder, and we'll be discussing his book, Gospel Media, Reading, Writing, and Circulating Jesus. I'm just going to jump right in and cover the myths that we leave out. This is called out in the conversation. There are eight of them. One, reading was always or usually allowed. Two, texts were always or usually engaged in communal reading events. Three, each gospel was written to be experienced the same way. Four, persons in antiquity did not often compose texts in their own hands. Five, composition always involved dictation, which was an act of freezing an oral discourse in written form. Six, the gospels were all written using the same compositional practices. Seven, Texts were distributed following a concentric circles model in which the discourse gained more influence and readers as it went systematically through these different social circles. And eight, the Gospels were all circulated the same way and in the same physical format, whether it be codex or roll. That covers all of the myths, so I will not belabor the point here. So without further ado, here's my conversation with Nicholas Elder. Nicholas Elder, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Before we get going, will you tell the listeners a little bit about yourself? Yeah, uh, I am Associate Professor of New Testament at the University of Dubuque. Uh, We have a theological seminary that's housed in the university, so I teach New Testament classes, I teach Greek classes, exegesis classes here, a lot of online teaching. So we serve primarily Presbyterian Church USA, PCUSA students seeking ordination, as well as quite a bit of undergraduate teaching here in Dubuque, Iowa. I am also a distance runner. I have a big family of six. Yeah, those are some of the things that are important about me. Yeah, that last one's a pretty big deal. Okay, so I know we have a time limit. So diving in, I will run through what all of the myths are. So I don't feel like we need to recap those in the episode. Okay. And because I prefer like a positive assertion. So knowing that the listeners are going to have heard all of those things before we get into the interview, how would you describe what you are asserting in this book and the book, sorry for the listeners is gospel media, reading, writing, and circulating Jesus. How would you describe what you are asserting here rather than just what you're dispelling? Yeah, that's a great way to put it. So my central assertion is that the way that people read, wrote, and circulated text in the ancient world was complex and diverse. This was true of the Greco-Roman world, generally speaking. It was true of Judaism in the time, what's called Second Temple Judaism. And it was true of early Christians and the gospel authors and audiences, that the way that these gospels were were read happened in multiple ways. The way that they were written happened in multiple ways. And the way that they were circulated happened in multiple different ways. And so you like to begin with... the way I was understanding it is the technology itself. So the the misconception of the technology of reading and writing is important. But so where does a misunderstanding of how people in antiquity read and wrote, where does that lead us as far as when you're reading a text now? I think it helps us to recognize that when we are reading a text now, that it happens in diverse ways, just as it did in the ancient context. Even when you ask that question, my first thought is me sitting by myself 
reading a gospel text. But of course, that's not the only way that gospel texts get read today. Uh, the gospel texts, get they do get read that way individually uh, and silently in our heads, but they also get read in ecclesial context and in church settings in in, in segments. So you get a section of a reading of the gospel in, in an ecclesial context. You might uh, have a familial reading of the gospel that's communal and allowed with members of your immediate family. Uh, you might have a sort of academic reading of a portion of a gospel as you engage engage the text in a scholarly manner. And these are all ways that are, those are all reading. Those are all what William Johnson would call reading events different kinds of reading events and different ways to read the Gospels. And that was also the case in the ancient world, that when we imagine reading, we should imagine reading of these particular texts, of Gospel texts, and I would say this extends to New Testament and Biblical texts, generally speaking as well. We shouldn't imagine sort of one form of reading, whether it be communal reading, individual silent reading, whatever it might be, that there were a number of different ways that these texts were, were engaged. And so our sort of imagination for the reading and the engagement and the audience of the Gospels changes when we recognize the diversity and complexity of ways that these texts were engaged. I think even operating under the misapprehension, the myth that you're addressing, I know as a teenager, I was being taught, oh, most of the people couldn't read, so just the convention was everyone was having it read to them, but the value placed in the contemporary world was you need to be reading independently. So it's almost like right. we're not, I don't know, in, in this drive for authenticity, which pushed us toward reading individually, we were also acknowledging a thing that you're saying now, no, it was more complex than that. It was as complex as our situation is. Yeah, exactly right. This is, it's so confusing to me. Why would someone arrive at the conclusion that no reading only happened in this way? And to go to the lengths that I know you say, people couldn't read silently to themselves. Mm -hmm. And then you give us a block of text in the book to show, no, that's not true. Because I know I read it to yeah. myself and I was like, I'd always heard this thing and it's not true. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. I think that's exactly why why we go to such links is because we've always heard that thing and it just becomes part of sort of the way that we think. And this is why I call, why I address these as myths. And by myth, I don't necessarily mean false. There are, in any myth, there's a kernel of truth. There's something being communicated that, that, that has value. But a myth is something that shapes our understanding and shapes our worldview and, and oftentimes is left un, unscrutinized. And so when I use the term myth, that's the way I'm thinking of myth. These assumptions that we have that go unscrutinized, and we should have just all heard them so we believe them to be true. They get passed down to someone else and these myths just get carried on, even though the evidence when you look at the evidence, it, it says something, it shows something very differently. And so that's, as you mentioned, I oftentimes will give a block of text and say, hey, here's the myth, but look what this block of text says. So oftentimes in the book, I'm trying to let the evidence actually speak for itself to say, hey, this is what the text says. And let's directly contrast that with the idea, the myth that we have, that we've repeated over and over again. I think my initial thought as I was beginning the book was this really does fit within uh, an understanding I'm developing of biblical studies being, and I think it was Alexiana Fry who gave me this word, transdisciplinary. And so mm. you call out that like in classical studies, the notion that was held onto in biblical studies that, well, people only read aloud was immediately challenged. But yeah, it seems right. to have taken a while within biblical studies. So are we seeing in biblical studies more external ideas coming in to help evaluate biblical texts? Yeah, I think that's exactly right. I think we are becoming less and less siloed. Maybe as biblical scholars, we are more siloed than many other disciplines still. But we do see the influence of other fields coming in. We are doing a lot better than a previous generation of biblical scholars of letting different kinds of evidence con complexify our thinking and not thinking only with the biblical text, but really uh, doing a better job of situating the biblical text within their various contexts in the plural. And that's one of the things that I really try to do in this book is bring in all kinds of different 
primary source evidence from a number of different fields. So I engage things like the documentary papyri, that is to say the everyday writings that are non-literary in form, things like personal letters written to from one family member to another family member. I engage things like the work of the philosopher, physician, or Dr. Uh, Galen, and what he has to say about his own writing and publication and circulation of text, as well as things like Greco-Roman literary elite figures, or Cicero, and in addition to things like the, the more standard fare of biblical studies, the Second Temple Jewish texts, whether those be pseudepigrapha, apocryphal texts, and then also, of course, biblical texts themselves. So I do think that we are seeing a movement to engage all kinds of different sources and fields. And, and I try to reflect that in, in this book and allow different kinds of evidence speak to the different myths that are addressed. So this is a turn from where we were going, but I think it is still on topic. So I, I don't know, like 10, 15 years ago, I read a blog post by Paul Krugman. It doesn't matter that an economist wrote this, but he was saying he felt like we made too much of a big deal about things like iPods being hmm. technological advances because it was a much more significant advance and innovative change to go from having no recorded sound to having sound recorded on wax. And I try to bring that up to people to say, when we talk about technology now and people freak out about AI or whatever, that... I don't think technology is that different. So looking mm. at written media as a form of technology, because it is like a shovel is, are we, do, do you look at the world that we're in and how we engage with messages as that significantly different? Or can we understand ancient people similar to ourselves? And how would you point us to that? Or would you say, no, Jared, you're wrong. No, I think you're right, Andrew. On the one hand, I think there is a way in which that if we were to plop down someone from the first century into our present context, they would have a hard time making sense of a lot of the media that we use. It would be, of course, a completely foreign, a foreign world to them. Things have certainly changed in the last 2000 years of how we engage media. But at the same time, Media is always a conduit for expressing and communicating human thought. And in that sense, what media fundamentally is hasn't changed. And what it is, what it's doing and accomplishing hasn't necessarily changed. And also humans have not necessarily fundamentally changed in the last 2000 years, or at least the biology and evolution of our brains has not changed significantly in the last 2000 years. So when people will make the claims that 2000 years ago, it would have been very difficult for a human being to read silently, like brain capacity wise, ability wise, that to me, that's just silly because we really haven't changed that much in the last 2000 years. So on the one hand, there, there are ways in which media have changed. And we've seen, we go through these media revolutions, things like the creation of paper. This is one that often gets overlooked for the printing press, of course, huge development in the history of media for fixing text, being able to give us exact replication in a way that we didn't have previously as humans, but also the ability and the ubiquity of paper, the ability to have so much of our thought communicated in writing in that medium. Two major changes there. We, of course, have the shift of electronic media and communication, our ability to communicate, me and you able to communicate like this, and then to, to other people as the podcast, podcast goes out into the world. These are all major changes and revolutions, but at the end of the day, they are still doing the same thing as other ancient media did. They're taking our thoughts, the things that are in our minds, and communicating them to other persons in a way that is iterable, can be, can be used again and again on more than one occasion. It's good that I'm right and wrong because I'm covering my bases there. I So the idea then is we're engaging with one another and there's no more authentic or sincere form of communication through media because I think it is tempting sometimes to see it as the seesaw going one way or the other. I think sometimes people think the way that they did it and it's and this is scripture and it just is what it is. But you're saying it was what, 15th century? when we started to really be able to circulate texts that were reliably the same thing that the person yeah. next to us is reading. Yeah, so, that's exactly right. 
it is a social engagement, no matter how you're doing it, even if it's you and I here on this Riverside recording. So is, yeah. is that kind of an angle of entry for us to understand they're not that different from us? Yeah, I think that's exactly right. And I thought the, I'm glad you used the term social because I and mean, this is one of the main themes of the book is that communication and media are always social affairs. Even when a person is engaging a text on their own and individually, there's a social dynamic to that insofar as you are engaging someone else's thought. So there's always something there's always something social. Um, there's a sort of sociality to media. And this is true of the biblical text as well. That you're engaging other people's other people's thoughts. And so the form into which the thought goes, the medium, is socially conditioned in a way. And I, I also would be remiss, we, I have not yet mentioned Marshall McLuhan and his famous dictum that the medium is the message. In so far as so McLuhan's idea is that, that there's always a way in which the medium into which thought goes changes the message of that thought. So while communication is always social, while media is always socially conditioned, there's a way in which the thing that we put our thought into is going to change, is going to change the way that we communicate it. The way that I am telling you about this book is going to be very different than the way that I write this book insofar as we are communicating in two different media forms. And so this is why I think it's important to recognize what media form is being utilized and to recognize that there are a diversity of media forms in the ancient world because that is going to change the way the change the way that the message is communicated at the end of the day so we have a sociality to media and we do have a sense in which humans haven't changed in the last 2000 years but what we put our thought into how we communicate our thought does affect how that thought is received by other human beings one of the things that you discuss in the book is circulation, H how biblical texts, if that's your concern, how they were circulated. And I, I think the way I want to approach that, my question for you is, so you teach at a seminary. So the people you're teaching have been exposed to biblical texts probably their whole lives. Now they're, they want to make a vocational decision for the rest of their life, for their careers. How do you see that the the misunderstanding that you're dispelling how do you see that on the ground as it applies to circulation about biblical texts in their earliest phases yeah that's a good question sorry i don't, I don't have a good answer right off the top of my that's head okay you, 30 minutes maybe, of silence that's the rest yeah. of the podcast <laughs> yeah, that's good yeah we'll just do that it's all right maybe can you ask it ask the question maybe a, 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 another way okay so uh, the the most pervasive context for biblical text is churches or synagogues. So yeah, you churches. deal with people who spent their whole lives in churches. Yeah. How have you seen this misunderstanding, if you've seen it at all, affect their thinking about biblical texts when they come into the room in your classroom? Uh, yes. So I think there is the misunderstanding that maybe this is how biblical texts were always experienced, that they were always experienced in a communal church-like setting, being read aloud. And of course, this was one way, one very prominent way in the ancient world and then in the history of interpretation that biblical texts were experienced. But again, it wasn't the only way. And so part of the argument about in part three of the book, which is concerns circulation, which by the way, is a little bit different than publications. I use the term circulation rather than publication intentionally. Circulation doesn't imply a getting out to the public necessarily. It is more of a, an umbrella term of how text got passed about. Whereas with respect to publication, there's a sense in which an author is intending the the text to get out to a public audience, to make it known to people that author does not necessarily know. Uh, but so when it comes to the circulation of the Gospels, there would have been multiple different ways that the Gospels were circulated and got out there, multiple different audiences. Um, for example, I think that the Gospel of Mark in its first century context would have been best circulated or best pub made public or the most natural way to experience something like the Gospel of Mark would be through a public reading or performance of the entire thing. And you see this even today, uh, the, the Gospel of Mark, people like Phil 
Phil Ruge Jones or Max McLean can still perform the Gospel of Mark in, it, in its entirety and it be a very compelling story. And the Gospel of Mark begins with this phrase, the Gospel, the good news. And in the in Greek and in the first century context, this term has the sense of orally proclaimed good news. Uh, so you have something like Mark that is probably best disseminated or best circulated, uh, not in a reading of a small section as you would have in a church context, but in its entirety. Then you have something like the Gospel of Luke, which is addressed to an individual at its very beginning, Theophilus. Uh, and so in the book, I take that addressed to an individual seriously. And I argue that, in fact, Theophilus was the first reader of the Gospel of Luke and that the Gospel of Luke was first written for one individual reader. And then from there, you get the Gospel sort of Luke going out to wider audiences, being circulated further and further afield. And then something like the Gospel of Matthew, I actually think would be very much akin to how one might experience a Gospel in a modern church context that I think Matthew was, which by the way, calls itself a book in Matthew 1.1. 1, 1. So we have different titles for Mark and Matthew, what they call themselves at their beginnings. But the Matthew is probably intended for sort of a, a synagogue-like setting. That Matthew models itself on Jewish reading practices from the first century in which scripture, and I think Matthew has high aims for itself as a document from the get-go, but that would have been experienced in smaller chunks or sections that were read and then explained in the church context, as we have today with the reading of scripture, proclamation of the word, this kind of thing. So all of that to say, when students think about how they experience the gospels or how they experience scripture and have for maybe their entire lives, they're probably thinking of something that would have been native maybe to the way that Matthew was circulated, but maybe a little bit less native to the way that other gospels might have been circulated. So I, I'm not sure how old you are and you don't have to disclose if you don't want to. So <laughs> I'm 40. So in the 90s, when I was a teenager, I remember this big kick for authenticity. It was the early phases of emerging church. And that was really attractive to people about my age. And there was also this like small group house church thing. And there was so uh -huh. much certainty that this is what they were. And then probably 2004, 2005, I read a Mark Nanos book and he was talking about these communities existing in synagogues. So I I'm not saying uh -huh. there were no house churches. It was all synagogues. It was a novel idea, revolutionary to me, that it was anything but house churches, right? They couldn't have churches, buildings of their own. And that was until Constantine. There was all of this residual buildup that, that we used to understand authenticity. So I guess what I'm wondering is in the things that your students have been taught, mostly in church settings, do you come across things like that that you have to be like, oh, hold on? Uh, it's more complex. And that may even be mm. part of the reason you wrote this book, not just your peers, yeah. but also your students. Is that fair to say? Yeah, yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah. So that kind of thinking is, I think, is pervasive. And it was pervasive for me as well. You know, it's in many of the things that I address in this book, many of the myths, these are things that that I thought and believed and held to until I looked at the evidence. But many of the things that I am uh, trying to dispel are things I thought several weeks before writing that particular chapter. But one of the things that I think that is very interesting about what you just said about your experience and thinking about the differences between house churches and synagogues, one of the one of the themes that one of the things that I often say in my class or often bring up in my classes is the way that many of our assumptions have a sort of pervasive and, and in some ways insidious, and we don't recognize it as such, anti-Judaism to them. That we assume, and again, I put myself in this camp, that the early church was different. It was more organic. It was less formal and rigid and law-like than was the synagogue. So of course, the early Christians couldn't have been meeting in a synagogue setting. They must have been in these sort of like authentic house church kind of settings and, and engaging the new fresh word of the New Testament as opposed to the sort of rigid law of Judaism, where again, the reality is it is most likely that much of early Christian reading practices actually looked a whole lot like early Jewish reading practices. And of course, by the way, we separating out early Judaism and early Christianity. If you're reading Mark Nanos, of course, this is uh, far more complex than just there are the Christians here, there are the Jews here, and never the twain 
shall meet. Yeah, so I do think there are so many different assumptions. And again, it goes back to the sociality about all of this stuff. These are so social acts that that there's all different kinds of complex factors involved with respect to reading and writing and one's identity and sociality and all of these kinds of things. I know this isn't something that you directly, like, it's not one of the myths, but orality has been this thing in the back of my head for a very long Mm -hmm. time. And I'm just slowly trying to get my feelers out there to see who, and if you're like, that's not what I'm here to talk about. We're here to talk about my book, but there was this idea put in my head years ago that, oh, it was all oral transmission. That's what's important. What's the, the ratio there, do you think, of written to oral transmission early on? Yeah, that's a great question. And, and in some ways, the orality has, in the last 10 years or so, has gotten a a bad name. There was this sort of turn to understanding oral traditions. And in a lot of, in a lot of biblical scholarship, there's this, there's the question of what do we even mean when we say an oral tradition or an oral text? And, but I do, I think the oral context of the ancient world is very important, but what, so what has often happened is that oral context has swallowed up the textual context as if as if everything was orality which is simply which is simply not the case but and i am very much interested in this the question of the transition from a, from something that is oral to something that is written and i don't know if i can necessarily quantify this percentage was oral this percentage was was textual or written but i would say i think the gospel of mark and I make this argument in the book, is a key transition point from an oral tradition that is previously unwritten to a a textual tradition. And I mentioned earlier uh, that very first word of the Gospel of Mark, gospel, euangelion, in the ancient context indicated oral news. If you were to hear the word euangelion or gospel or its verbal equivalent, euangelizomai, or to proclaim news, you would think something oral. You would not think something written. And and I think this is a really innovative move on Mark's part, is that it takes that oral tradition, takes that orality, and puts it into the textual mode. And then from there, you get this sort of, the other gospels will, will take the textual gospel, the textualized, orally proclaimed good news, and and run with it in a written literary direction. So I guess maybe if I were to quantify it, I would say something like maybe 25% insofar as Mark Mark has a foot in the oral life world, and then the other three canonical gospels do something different. They do something more textual and literary, which would be then the other 75% on the textual grounds as far as the gospels themselves. And of course, the behind the gospels, behind, you have you might have oral traditions that we no longer have access to simply because orality is fleeting. There's no, there's not a record of orality there way, the way that there is a record of textuality, at least in the ancient world. You don't, you, you of course don't have recordings of things that were said. You have to have the writing to record what was said. So there may, there very well may have been many other Jesus traditions. Of course, people were saying things about Jesus from the time he was born up until the present day many of which we just no longer have access to because they're lost to the oral world. So the orality is the distinction of the euangelion, and then you have the biblos in Mm -hmm. Matthew, right? right? Matthew or Luke? Matthew. Matthew Matthew. one is biblos. Biblion in Luke, which is... No, actually, Biblion... No, Biblion and John. John, uh, okay. Yeah, yeah, this is great. This is great, yeah. And yeah, Biblion and Biblos. So Biblos, again, Matthew 1, 1, the Biblos of the Genesis of Jesus Christ, the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, which I take to be a title for all of Matthew. There's some scholar, scholars who might quibble about that and say, actually, it only refers to the genealogy at the beginning of Matthew. But well, let's say I take Biblos book to be a designation for Matthew as in its entirety. I take Euangelion as a designation for Mark it's in its entirety. And then John, we have Biblion, which is not the same word as Biblos. It's a more generic term, just a document. But that one occurs at the end of the Gospel of John, uh, 
two times in what are called the colophons in John chapter 20 and in John chapter 21. These things were written in this document. I take John to be a little bit nondescript in the kind of document or the media form that it is. And it's a bit more generic. And I think this is because John knows of these other written traditions. And I believe that John probably knows all three of the synoptics and probably has textual access to them, but does not necessarily rely on them. So what John is saying is, hey, other people have written this stuff up. I'm another, I'm a drop in the sort of bucket of Jesus traditions that already exist, but you should still take me seriously because I am writing sort of the other stuff that's not included, not that's not included in these other documents that have already been written up. And then Luke doesn't have a designation for itself. It does not use a, a media term, whether it be gospel, book, document. What Luke does uniquely is in chapter one, verses one through four, is has a preface that is addressed to an individual uh, whose name is Theophilus. And people do different things with this address to an individual. But the argument that I make with respect to Luke is that I look at other prefaces that are like Luke 1, 1 through 4, written by people like, I mentioned Galen earlier, he has a number of these, where he will write to an individual, usually an individual who is in his sphere of influence. Sometimes it's a student. Sometimes it's someone that's just interested in what Galen has to say. Galen's a doctor. What Galen has to say about the heartbeat or whatever it might be. And Galen will, will write up a, a tract or a document for that particular individual and oftentimes will very much have that individual's needs, that individual's uh, pre-understanding in mind as Galen writes up this document. And Galen expects that even though he's writing to an individual, that probably the document is going to circulate beyond that individual's reach. But he is very much writing for a particular individual. And so I think we need to take Luke's preface very seriously when he says, I wrote for you, Theophilus. And I think that Luke is writing for this one particular individual, even if he knows that sort of the document is going to go beyond Theophilus's reach. So do you see, just sticking with the Gospels, do you see a unifying genre there or do they all have their own thing or some of them are together and some aren't? Yeah, that's a great question. And I, I think of genre and media as two different kinds of things, gospel, book, document, and whatever we want to call Luke, individual text written for an individual reader. Epistle. Those are all media designations indicating sort of different forms of media, different ways to communicate. And I don't think we get as much direct genre identification in any of the Gospels, though I would say that, that the Gospels are probably, if I were to give one genre category to them, and there's been a, a recent uh, excellent article on just this topic written by uh, Dr. Andy Byers, uh, that, that the genre of Gospel is Gospel, that the the good news taken from Mark, and he's dealing specifically with the gospel of Mark, is that this sort of new way of textualizing Jesus' traditions in the gospel form is what the genre of the gospels are. I do think the class, the, the, the most common assertion, of course, is that the gospels are related to to ancient biographies. And Helen Bond has a, a really excellent book, a few years old now, maybe five years old now, on the Gospel of Mark being the first biography of, of Jesus. So I do think there are, if we were to find a sort of single comparative genre for the Gospels, I think biographies are probably our best bet. But of course, there are ways in which the Gospels don't match up with the Greek biographies. But all that to say, media and genre are two different phenomenon in, in my mind. And I actually don't, I don't make a lot of arguments about the genre of the Gospels in, in this particular book. And, and that's a fair point. I guess I was looking for, so we are talking about these things and I look, they're at the front of the New Testament. So we're taking them all together. Uh, my question was more, should we? Because it does sound like there are some pretty distinctive characteristics, mm. but they are all pointing toward the same yeah. thing. They have similar intentions, just different media being used to do that. And yeah. the orality stuff is interesting, and I'm, I hope that wasn't too much of a non sequitur given the the subject of the book. But oh, I know it's great. If most people aren't reading 
the way that they're communicating and the medium is the message. I think that's, you know, right. That's how it goes. So what do we see in these texts of orality? Are there things that you can look at and be like, oh, yep, this was like a mnemonic kind of thing or something like that? Mm, yeah. Yeah, that's a great question. And again, yeah, the medium is the message. So writing is always going to have its effect. It's always going to change the oral mode. So even though I think the Gospel of Mark is uh, orally proclaimed good news put into the textual medium, the writtenness of Mark is going to change that. So I should say where I see orality most at play is, is going to be in the Gospel of Mark. You might also think of orality at play in maybe the large teaching sections of Jesus in, in Matthew or Luke, but that's a really different kind of orality. That's almost orality as a fiction insofar as it is a written form of an oral event, of the oral teaching. And I think it probably reflects some things that Jesus said, that's things that Jesus taught, but it is not a freezing. It's not as though we're taking an Again, back to this authenticity bit. I don't think the large teaching chunks in Matthew and Luke are taking Jesus's teaching in a live dictation kind of way. That writing has changed the way that Jesus's uh, teaching is presented in the Gospels of Matthew and Luke. But as a whole, I would say if we have anything that's closest to a, a transcript of someone speaking, the Gospel of Mark is going to be our best bet insofar as Mark has what some have often called an oral style. And what oral style means is debated from person to person. But there are things about, if you read the Gospel of Mark, it, it reads more like someone speaking a story aloud. And this is why I think the Gospel of Mark still works as a performance, as a sort of one-person show, as people like, again, Phil Ruby Jones or Max McLean will do, because you, in, its, in the form of its writing, I think it reflects a more transcriptive type of event. So part two of the book is on writing and there's a, diver a, a bunch of different ways you can write in the ancient world. You can write individually with your own hand. You can dictate to a scribe who will take live dictation of what you wrote down and try and get it to reflect exactly what you said. Or they will also, because writing always changes the form of communication, they will take down the message or take down whatever was said, but it will get changed in the act of writing. So I do think the Gospel of Mark has this, these oral characteristics to it, and we see these in particular features of Mark. It's very well known that Mark is the most paratactic of the Gospels. That is to say, it, it uses and all the time. And I have some statistics in the book on how often Mark uses the word and or chi in Greek compared to the other Gospels. And so what Matthew and Luke, they don't like Mark using and all the time. They change the sort of ubiquity of Mark saying, and this happened and that happened. And they will make more complex sentences, more complex clauses by changing the ands to buts or to creating new, by creating new sentences, putting different clauses in different kinds of relationship to one another. And that's a very written kind of thing to do. It, it requires slowing down and thinking about how clauses and sentences relate to one another. So Mark's parataxis is a sign of orality to my mind. Also things like the historical present. This is when an event in the past is being narrated in present time. I go and he says to me, using those present tense verbs, even though I'm describing something that happened in the past, Mark does this on 150 occasions, uses 150 historical presents. And once again, Matthew and Luke really don't like this. They both change Mark's historical presence to true past tense verbs. And to my mind, these are all things that sort of suggest that Mark is more like an oral transcription, that it was probably composed in the oral mode in a way that Matthew and Luke and John as well were not. That's an interesting idea. What, when you were writing the book, so this can be something you learned that was really exciting or something you already knew that you maybe found a better way to articulate, what was the most exciting thing for you to put into this book? I think the most exciting thing for me is the ways in which people in the ancient world, and this harkens back to the beginning of our conversation, were not that that different from us. Just one in their everyday lives. There are, of course, many things that are very different about how 
people live their everyday lives in the ancient world to the way that we do. But the sort of the ways, the things that I would find that are comparative between ancient media practices and modern media practices. So one one example of this, my my kids formerly went to a Montessori elementary school. And when they learn to write, they learn to write using what are called metal insets, where there is a metal cutout of the letter that one traces just to learn how to write the letter, but also to strengthen one's hand. So as I was reading Quintilian's The Order's Education, so Quintilian, first century rhetorician, and he talks about how to train children in writing. And he says, it's really important that that the order be able to write really well, not only write eloquently, but also physically, like the physical form, the handwriting should look good. And he says the best way to do this is to use grooved letters where a kid practices with, that the child practices tracing their Greek letters in these essentially the same thing, metal insets. And Quintilian says, because it improves the strength of their hand and because it's just a more enjoyable thing for the child to do. And so you look at Quintilian's, what he has to say about this, and you can directly compare it to what Dr. Maria Montessori, a 20th century educational theorist, what they have to say about how a child should learn to read and write. And they basically say the exact same thing as one another. And I found these kinds of things with respect to not only writing, but with also respect to reading and publication, that we have so many ways in which the ancient context is really not as different is not that different from the modern context. I like to say people are people and we're not that special. Um, So as far as reading goes, and it doesn't have to be specifically the area that this book covers, it can be anything with regard to biblical studies, history, language, archaeology, whatever. What would you direct people to get a better understanding? Or it can be within this area. Yeah, yeah, great question. Uh, Other Um, than your book. Obviously, we want people to buy and read your book. Yeah. Are we talking modern things to read right now or ancient things to read right now or both? It's whatever you want. Dealer's choice. Yeah. Great. Great. So I have been very influenced by the work of William A. Johnson, who is a classicist, and he is uh, cited probably as much as anyone else in, in this book. So if you want to get a real sense of how the cultures and sociality of reading, writing, and publication, what they were like, especially amongst the highfalutin literary elites of the day. His work is a go-to. As far as the ancient context goes, there's not uh, necessarily... What's hard about studying reading, writing, and publication, studying media in any context, is we don't often self-reflect and clearly state uh, how we're going about doing these things. There's not necessarily a handbook about how one prepares to do a podcast interview where we write all that stuff down and then 2,000 years from now, someone might come across it and say, oh yeah, this is how they did that kind of stuff. And the same thing is true in the ancient world. There's not one place where all of these uh, practices and realities are are listed out. So you, and what I've had to do in this book is piece together evidence from a variety of different fields. But one thing that I love, I absolutely love to do and anyone can do, no, no matter their level of training in biblical studies or in Greek or whatever language is to engage more documentary or non-literary papyri. That is to say, writings from everyday persons in the ancient world. People are people, no matter the time period. You can go and you can read what what some some random Joe, Sally, wrote 2,000 years ago to their parent or to their brother or their sister in letters. Uh, There's a volume of non-literary papyri in the Loeb Classical Library, but there's also an excellent resource called papyri.info, an online resource. You type into a web address, papyri.info, and you can search thousands and thousands of ancient, ancient everyday writing. You can search it by translation. So if there is an English translation or not, you can search it by document, whether it be uh, an ancient receipt, whether it be an ancient letter, and you can search by time period. So one recommendation would be to go down the rabbit hole of of ancient papyri documents, uh, papyri.info. I find that I oftentimes get sucked into that rabbit hole and come out four hours later, having read something about the price of camels in Alexandria in the second century or something like this. 
I know, and I don't remember the name, but I'll have it in the show notes along with everything you just named. Amanda Podney had a book that came out last year about the ancient Near East. And she begins by basically reading Yelp reviews for a merchant. And it felt really soothing to hear, oh, life was not that different. They just had fewer avenues to present information to one another, but they were basically the same as us. (laughs) They were mad about this guy's scheduling or whatever. So a question that I've added at the end here, what do you read for fun? Oh, I read kids books with my kids for fun. So we do a lot of, do a lot of children's books. So I have twins who are, are five years old. So we're into a Dave Pilkey right now. Lots of dog man in my house for my young guests. Um, and then a lot of, a lot of fiction in my house for my older kids. Speaking of the different ways that texts are read, we regularly read as a family. And that's a kind of reading event that is common in many is is common in the ancient context and and is common in in the modern context. Lots of children's literature outside of my scholarly reading. These Throw days. some out there. What are some recurring titles? Yeah, let's see. My, I've just read with my six year old a book called Free Water. I have it over here by Amina Lukman Dawson. It's a it's a Newbery Medal Award winner from maybe a year or two ago. So we read. We just finished up that one. It's an imaginative historical fiction with what else title-wise. With my second grader right now, we are in the throes of Shel Silverstein. We're reading collective poems of Shel Silverstein, A Light in the Attic, and Where the Sidewalk Ends. Yeah, so it's sort of flavor of the week. Sometimes the kids are choosing the children's literature. Sometimes I'm picking things out for them. I know it was, uh, mine's a teenager now. It was a tough day when we transitioned from reading Mr. Brown Can Moo, Can You, and Goodnight Moon every night. And then I started reading Harry Potter or something. And then he was like, no, I'm going to read this on my own. And (laughs) Mm -hmm. (laughs) it gets tough when they get older. So I'm going to go ahead and say, unless you have anything else, was there something that, you know, hey, I'm going to sit down and do an interview. This is definitely something I want to talk about. Was there something I left out? that you would like to throw in there before we sign off? I don't think so. It's been a, it's been a great time. I have no last word. Okay. Thank you for being here. Yeah. Thank you so much, Jared. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much for listening. Please subscribe and rate the podcast on your favorite platform. If you are interested in following supporting or engaging with the podcast anywhere else, check out the link tree that I've hyperlinked in the show notes. I try to put episodes out as soon as possible for $5 a month on Patreon. So if there's something that I've announced or you've seen on social media, just know $5 a month. You can listen to every episode that I have edited and I try to get them up within a week of recording the conversation. Take care.